Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Today is the last presentation, uh, specialized presentation on the restoration of heritage uh, buildings. So today's presentation is about heritage buildings and clusters in the city of Beirut and will be presented by Abdul Hadim Jabir, a member of BHI and an architect urbanist that has been fighting for heritage preservation for more than 30 years. Enjoy the presentation. Hello, everyone. Happy to be with you this afternoon. Uh, first, uh, you know, I'll, uh, I'll start with a uh, bit of an overview of the national planning climate before we zoom in on Beirut and the issues of heritage areas. Uh, Lebanon, to my mind, regressed from a young, elegant nation in the 50s and the 60s, uh, where the city was shaped by diverse plans that were not uh, fully implemented in any uh, version uh, of them, but definitely the, these successive plans uh, were instrumental in uh, structuring the uh, morphology of the city, its streets uh, and uh, its urban blocks. Uh, Central Beirut uh, received a lot of attention during and after the war, concluding with the Solidaire project, which is to be seen could very well uh, join the uh, set of unfulfilled visions. Of course, at the national level, we, we, we have major issues in terms of zoning and protecting our environment, and that also affects uh, the center of the city in, in indirect ways, which we will not discuss today. Uh, but this kind of evolution boils down to the following, uh, that we have uh, at the national uh, and sector scale, uh, we have uh, diverse uh, actors and agents that do not coordinate with each other, like the Ministry of Culture, Finance and Public Works. Uh, and of course, locally in Beirut, we have a municipality that is not proactive at all. Uh, such that the uh, development of the city is driven by real estate uh, speculation and the investment climate. Of course, we have an active uh, civil society that uh, weighs in on various issues uh, throughout. Uh, historically, this we have we, we're looking at 50 years of uh, unchecked growth. Uh, with, la with a lacking vi overall vision, whether it's local or national. And uh, the, basically our zoning regulations are driven by real estate. And you probably uh, hear often the term sellable area. So it's really about co commodification of land and air rights and uh, how much money it can generate. Of course, the only uh, planning tool that still prevails uh, and controls development in Beirut through densities is the 1954 master plan, which is long overdue. It should be updated and really brought into the 21st century. This master plan, unfortunately for uh, many of us, most of us, concentrated high densities in the old areas around the center, uh, which drives up speculation and uh, uh, in, in, in a legal framework that is very lacking. Uh, and as such, the urban economy is dependent on real estate and uh, <clears throat> owners and developers are encouraged to demolish old buildings to create higher revenue, new developments. Uh, value of land is strongly correlated to how much you can build and development controls are very uh, quantitative and generous in the sense that they uh, uh, are all cont continuously updated uh, to favor uh, more revenue, as in the case of the 2004 update of the building law. And the, the, this all translates to a high incentive to demolish uh, heritage buildings and neighborhoods. Of course, the civil society groups weigh in. Uh, we have a very vibrant scene that, that really picked up in the past decade, uh, whether along uh, to protect the shoreline of the city or the urban heritage, or uh, to, to counter 
particular projects uh, like uh, a development in Raushi or the highway that would have cut across Ashrafi. And I will talk about that a bit later. Strongly associated with the issue of development and heritage is the issue of housing. And uh, of course, it's interrelated with the old rental law and the new one, which uh, denies access to most of the population, denies access to for affordable housing. And uh, in, in the local uh, mindset, it's a battle between owners and tenants. But we often forget uh, the uh, developer, uh, often with a multinational uh, component and uh, very competitive capital. Uh, such And uh, this, this process was very beautifully mapped by Nadine Bigdash in a movie uh, where she demonstrates in Zalablad how small pieces of land are bought by different agents, all feeding to the same developer to create one big of land that would allow the construction of a tower, in this case, Cielo, which faces uh, the Moor Tower. So we end up with a very checkered uh, and uh, increasingly chaotic uh, urban skyline and uh, typology. Uh, this is a photo taken uh, about five years ago by Fadlou Darir from Skygate, and it looks north towards the Abreen area, which has probably one of the highest dense, uh, lowest density heritage clusters in Ashrafi. So how do we deal with, with, with such a situation? Uh, now I will go into a tripart uh, such a presentation, which deals with what, how, and why, starting with what and looking at different scales of heritage. Of course, uh, this, this is the most human in scale, heritage at the scale of the individual building or structure. It's really, uh, uh, it includes houses, mansions, buildings, uh, uh, sarais, etc. And what, what is uh, essential at this scale is the typology of the building, uh, techniques, styles, etc., which were all very well covered in, in the uh, uh, sequence of lectures that uh, uh, we've had for the past uh, two weeks or three. Of course, you can see that uh, in this range of uh, what we understand as heritage, we have three different eras. We have the Ottoman, uh, uh, early 20th century Ottoman uh, heritage, uh, mostly you know the triple arch and uh, red tile roof houses. And then we have the transitional heritage, which, which corresponds with the French mandate, which, uh, which, which is hybrid, uh, often using uh, concrete uh, components for structural elements. And less known, but equally valid of the three eras is post-independence modern heritage, which uh, will hopefully be the subject of a subsequent series of lectures that BHI will give. And uh, the, why, why do we consider this heritage? Because it was built under, a, under zoning regulations that are no more in practice. So uh, with the combined, uh, with the uh, socioeconomic uh, conditions of, of the era, uh, the, the, this kind of building, uh, these buildings are irreplaceable uh, in terms of uh, the, the conditions that uh, brought them to life. So this is the first scale, this, the scale of the individual building. Of course, as most heritage buildings, they, they sit in large properties. Uh, so the, 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 the landscape, the whole, the, the, at the scale of the property is vital. It's really part, it's an integral and organic part of heritage. And it includes uh, a private and semi-private spaces, uh, that could be a simple garden with a with with little fountain, Birki. Uh, it could be uh, a larger uh, bustan, orchard. Uh, it could be, uh, 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 it could have specific trees, uh, but more importantly are the socio-spatial practices, how people inhabit the open space, the open uh, private and semi-private space, how they socialize, how they have productive landscape, the fruit trees uh, and sometimes uh, animals like chicken, etc. These are all an integral part of the household. So you cannot look at the, at the structure without its immediate context at the scale of the property. 
and uh, which uh, points to a fact that in Lebanon, uh, certainly in rural areas, but also uh, predominantly in urban areas, traditional landscape is productive. It's not decorative. It's not just to, to enjoy looking at or experiencing. It's really something that's integral to the well-being of the household. Of course, uh, uh, this translates to a, to a larger scale, that of the cluster, and uh, the, the situation, the, the uh, palette of uh, heritage becomes uh, wider here. It could be the traditional hosh or cul-de-sac or cl a cl cluster of small houses around a uh, semi-public area. It could be simply a street or an urban block. And uh, uh, with all that it carries, you know, of spaces, whether they, they are alleyways or orchards or uh, uh, small plazas, etc., and the uh, associated complexity of how to manage them. Because now we are v venturing into the public domain where and, uh, and uh, different legal uh, entities, uh, departments, and uh, uh, regulations applied. But that is essential to a holistic uh, understanding and effort to protect urban heritage. And finally, uh, the most preferable scale of protect of looking at heritage, understanding it, and uh, working uh, with it to revitalize it and, and protect it is the neighborhood scale or the planning uh, module, such as district or, uh, or zone. And uh, we'll be looking at this scale in, in, in the second part of the presentation. So, uh, so uh, heritage, urban heritage is hybrid. It's hybrid, hybrid in terms of uh, scales and uh, components, and it's also hybrid in terms of eras and uh, typologies. And uh, here, I, I really uh, made it a point to, to, to title the presentation, not a postcard, because we often have this pure uh, or kind of... Uh, a very selective understanding of what heritage is, you know, iconic images of architecture, but really, really the, the more evolving uh, and inclusive on this notion of heritage is, is hybridity and, uh, and, oh, and comes with it the way and tools we protect it. And uh, this is where urban design comes in because it, it manages this hybridity in all that it entails, whether it's socioeconomic diversity, or different densities, or uh, uh, different uh, issues to, to deal with, you know, such as traffic uh, management, uh, uh, parking management, uh, open spaces, etc. And of course, financing and uh, legal frameworks and governance. And just uh, four random examples, just to show how different uh, advanced societies deal with uh, uh, urban heritage. Uh, for example, here in London, Piccadilly Circus, we look at the same intersection uh, in the 60s and today. And uh, you know, in the 60s, uh, the car was the star of the urban scene. Streets were designed for cars. The whole mobility experience was around the car. And, uh, and there were not as many cars as we have today. Now, with, with evolving schools of thoughts and with increasing numbers of cars, the world is shifting more and more to, pub, uh, to public transportation and managing existing streets to make them more uh, amenable for pedestrians. And you can see the difference between left and right. Less asphalt, more plaza, uh, more uh, pedestrian areas. Even uh, the, what used to be a small roundabout now has grown and is uh, linking to the ground floors of adjacent buildings. This is a very uh, indicative uh, of, of, of a very complex trend. Uh, at a more uh, infrastructural scale, uh, cities, industrial cities built highways and bridges through that cut through the urban fabric, and they regretted that as soon as they inaugurated these projects and they embarked on very expensive endeavors to, to undo these mistakes and to reintroduce 
ground floor landscape and pedestrian uh, friendly uh, connectivity between areas that were uh, disconnected by these highways and infrastructural components. This is the case of the Central Artery in Boston, which was at the time of its adoption, the largest, most expensive federal project in the history of the United States. Uh, industrial uh, components uh, are considered heritage and in the evolving uh, schools of thought of how of what heritage is are incorporated in the uh, uh, mature fabric of the city. Of course, uh, this is uh, Viaduc des Arts in Paris, a rail industrial railway uh, uh, viaduct that was uh, that became obsolete and was uh, converted uh, in the past decade or so to a, a linear garden that connects uh, a couple of neighborhoods to Place de Bastille. Similarly, in New York, the skyline, uh, the, uh, the high line, uh, and uh, again, it uh, not only uh, it was uh, uh, conserved and developed into landscape, but it was the spine of new development that uh, was introduced in uh, Soho uh, at the time of uh, a few years ago. So now that we can have sort of established a, a, a complex and nuanced understanding of heritage in terms of scale, hybridity, and how we deal with it, uh, I will uh, move on to the second part. And I look, uh, uh, I will share with you uh, the evolution of thinking in, in Lebanon how we dealt with Beirut, uh, starting with the mid nineties up to uh, uh, the present. Uh, to my mind and uh, to, to, to many of my generation, it all started in 1995 during the, uh, with the first minister of culture, uh, Michel Eddy, who commissioned Absad uh, and the team led by Fadlo Darir and students from Alba to conduct uh, an inventory of uh, heritage buildings uh, in Beirut. At the time, it was buildings built before 1943, the year of independence. That was the uh, official uh, target uh, 25 years ago. Uh, it was done uh, uh, very uh, systematically. Uh, uh, and th this is just a, a random example, uh, and uh, <clears throat> it, it, it sort of uh, created a, an understanding of uh, what we then refer to as the Paris Central Districts, four districts uh, surrounding the uh, new Solidaire project at the time. And uh, basically, the way we looked at it, uh, I was part of the team that collaborated with Fadlu, Hana Alam al uh, Habib Dibis, and Wissam Jabr to make urban sense out of uh, this inventory. And we created uh, a kind of uh, uh, planning framework uh, made of three layers, the red being the inventory buildings, uh, the blue being their heritage vital proximity, whether it's gardens or uh, newer buildings that have the, a sympathetic uh, uh, scale, uh, uh, such as buildings after independence up to 1970. Uh, and of course, uh, adjacent areas that have reached their full density uh, in, the, in yellow. Of course, we started to identify uh, how to deal with the undeveloped uh, 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 not fully developed uh, exploited uh, uh, blue zones, and this is where we started to understand that to protect heritage, you have to deal with the zoning regulations and the excessive densities they allow. Uh, unfortunately, that didn't go very far. The Council of Ministers, uh, uh, against the recommendation of the planning authorities, they uh, decided to award uh, to shift the file to the Council of Development and Reconstruction, and they reverted with Khatib and Alami to uh, completing the inventory, but based on individual buildings uh, and uh, focusing on their architectural merit 
uh, merits and structural conditions. So the whole idea of clusters took a, a setback in 1998. And, uh, and uh, this is just to, to compare, you know, the, the urban logic of the cluster to the left and the architectural logic of individual buildings categorized in five degrees of interest uh, to the right. And this remained the status for a good uh, uh, 13 years until Minister Araiji assumed office in 2014 and uh, decided with uh, our help, Fadlo Dara, myself and others, to uh, revamp the antiquated law, uh, which uh, dates to 1993, and to maybe start thinking about the heritage plan for Beirut. So, so uh, the, uh, the, uh, until 2014, what governed heritage was a very piecemeal reactive approach. And as of 2014, a more integrated proactive approach was put in place, but not fully completed. So the first was, uh, we understood that laws cannot stand by themselves. They need spatial mapping to guide them. So we started talking about the master plan for Beirut. In, in, in parallel to understanding the legal framework. Now, the existing law, which dates uh, law 166, dates back to 1933, and it offers only two options to how to protect a heritage structure or property. One is to buy it by the public sector, something that was, con was considered doable uh, in the past century, but it's 100% uh, impossible in our times more so after the financial collapse uh, of, uh, of, of the economy in Lebanon. The second is, a, is to list the building and go into some kind of partnership between the owner and uh, the, uh, the public sector represented by the uh, Director General of Antiquities, something that no person in his or her right mind would do at the, at the moment. You don't want to be in eternal partnership with, with, the, with the public sector in Lebanon. So this is option one. Option two uh, for uh, larger scale protection is governed by uh, and the updated version of uh, the planning law, uh, and which looks at uh, areas that can be protected for their architectural character, which in a way in 1983 is the beginning of including a diverse understanding of heritage that is architectural character, not a period defined or a, a typology defined uh, uh, understanding of heritage. Now, uh, the, 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 the problem with, with, with the previous era is that uh, we were, of course, the law is obsolete. We're driven by market dynamics. Uh, we're always reacting. A, a people apply to uh, for a permit to demolish buildings, and uh, we are forced uh, to to assume a negative position and say no. And people go into lit litigation. Uh, also, the fact that you know all the heritage areas that that are are concentrated in Beirut around the downtown project are affected by the high real estate speculation of Solidaire, which increases the speculative value of property around Solidaire, especially where views are uh, uh, the case. So, so uh, with the high densities and the, and the high level of speculation, we had our work really cut for us. So the, 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 the parameters by which we, were, we tried to work since 2014 is to avoid case-by-case -case problem solving and develop general principles that we hope uh, and, and work to include them in, uh, in, uh, in a draft law, which we did and we completed in 2016. Uh, now, this law was adopted by the cabinet in 2017, and it's still in, in the parliament uh, to be discussed by the joint committees. What it does is it tries to achieve a balance between public interest and private uh, rights. Uh, it empowers local authorities without really infringing on ownership rights. Uh, it's holistic. And it looks uh, at uh, not just the built fabric, but also the social well-being of, of the owners and the tenants. 
And it, it really looks uh, creatively at the tools of financial compensation since uh, from you know a decade ago, we were aware that the uh, magnitude of heritage is with, with the evolving understanding is humongous and we cannot rely on public funds for that. So it has to be self-financing and we went for a combination of tax incentives and uh, uh, exemptions and of course the controversial uh, tool of transfer of development rights, which I will explain in a few minutes. Of course, this law is national and it doesn't stand alone, but it works uh, in, in complement with other laws existing laws uh, and it's a sort of uh, including but not limited to planning laws. So along with that we developed a heritage master plan. Uh, Fadlo Darer and I, we kind of relied on our memory and our uh, acquired experience from the 1990s to compile this and to make it a working draft that uh, we can um, uh, discuss with municipal authorities and Ministry of Culture uh, uh, decision makers. Now, in the orange are the uh, uh, areas that we had mapped in the 1990s, but in blue, we started introducing the idea of uh, modern heritage and natural uh, uh, heritage. For example, if you think of Raushi, uh, and Delhi and the whole modernist uh, string of buildings on the Corniche. This is an iconic image of Beirut. It's in postcards, it's in uh, uh, websites. You know, you go into the governor's office in Beirut and it's there in the lobby. So this is this kind of modernist and natural heritage uh, of Beirut is very much an integral part of something we must protect and uh, work with in revitalizing or developing any vision uh, for the city in the, in the generations to come. In parallel to that, unfortunately, the municipality was working on implementing a highway that was part of the 1954 master plan, a highway that would have cut through Ashrafi and uh, uh, Marum Khayil, uh, and it would have uh, really just plowed through uh, a, 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 a fabric that is rich with all the nuances of heritage that I talked to you about in the, in the early part of the presentation. So the, we, uh, the a citizen, a citizen action came in place and uh, we, we lobbied and we managed to stop the highway, which uh, if implemented would have uh, probably proceeded something like that. And you see in red how much a highway can impact, uh, not just buildings in red, but also uh, gardens, orchards, and such. Uh, and of course, if you if you come down to Marim Khayil, by that time, Marim Khayil had started to become a vibrant district uh, with uh, uh, creative industries, uh, civil society organizations, local and international, uh, small businesses, uh, and of course, uh, nightlife. And what the highway would have done to it is it would have cut across as if nothing existed. And of course, we lobbied and we uh, uh, offered very simple uh, solution that uh, would, imply, would uh, make best use of existing uh, infrastructural uh, components such as highways and wraps, et cetera, simply just improve uh, the condition and accessibility of these different junctions. Of course, Habib Divis uh, proposed his famous counter alternative to the highway, which is the linear part, something that we continue to uh, strive to achieve uh, till today. So uh, looking uh, at the same area, uh, we, this is from the room uh, St. George Hospital, looking to the sea. Uh, how would this new law that allow transfer of development rights work? In this photo, we see uh, three generations of, uh, of uh, buildings. Of course, uh, the low buildings uh, in yellow with the red tile roof are uh, early French mandate and Ottoman buildings, and they were created under a set of zoning regulations. 
To the right, you see buildings that were created uh, uh, just before the war. Uh, so these are buildings created by a different uh, uh, building code. And of course, we see the two buildings to the left, which were uh, a completely different scale and uh, much higher densities. And these are created by the 2004 update of the, of the building law. So get, presented with such a complex hybrid and financially challenging uh, situation, how do you, uh, uh, how can we protect these clusters and what kind of tools can we envisage? One of them is, of course, to, you know, to, to address squarely the issue of uh, how uh, a lot, very high densities that are allowable by the building law can be addressed. Let's say that these are the unbuilt uh, densities that uh, can be reached under the current zoning regulations as updated in 2004. Of course, this, uh, this could be devastating if applied to a whole area. It, I mean, uh, th these are virtual uh, quantities uh, and they would not be built, of course, over a building, but they would require demolishing a building to build a modern one with basements, uh, different structural grid, et cetera, which is something that would be detrimental to the cohesion and diversity of the uh, heritage zone. So quantitatively, purely quantitatively, one, the idea would be that we can transfer uh, the surplus development to, to locations that can take it. Of course, in this image, it's demonstrated within the same street, something that is uh, extremely discouraged. It should not happen within the same street, but rather because it would give an urban fabric that's exactly uh, contrary to what, uh, what heritage protection is about. Uh, and this is, as I mentioned, urban design. Urban design allows you to address the hybridity and complexity of a situation. And in this case, we, we would envisage that uh, the blue zones that we invented in uh, uh, 1997 uh, would, would, be, uh, would be reduced in density and the surplus density would be through using the new law and urban design as a, as a, as a managing tool, they would be transferred to areas that have larger sites and, uh, and are served by better infrastructure like highways or boulevards, and that can take uh, maybe a 20% surplus. Of course, ideally, if we can do that at the scale of the city, that would be optimal because it would allow us to recalibrate the mistake that was, there, that was made in 1954, whereby high densities were concentrated in the center of the city. And, this tool of transfer of development rights could be uh, done to, uh, uh, to, 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 would be a major uh, uh, contributor to the new master plan of the city, and it would create a more balanced ec uh, economically and heritage-wise uh, future for the, for the capital of Lebanon. What remains to be done is, I mean, of course, you know, I talked about uh, three successive studies, uh, our DGU study, uh, the Khadib and Alami CDR study, and uh, uh, the one we did with the Ministry of Culture in 2014. Added to it after the explosion is a substantial inventory uh, prepared by BBHR20. I think it's high time that we uh, consolidate all of these into one heritage layer for the whole city of Beirut. Now, here and now, we are in the aftermath of a, uh, a tremendous explosion that really uh, changed how we look uh, at the city. Uh, it changed its economy. It's changed, it's, it's possibly, uh, ch it, it has significant impact on its demographics, something we hope to mitigate and to reverse as soon as we can. But basically what we need to do as architects, planners, and urban designers is to have a new mindset and new, new modes of work. We need to be more efficient uh, in how we work using more efficient tools. And we need to have a big vision uh, for generations to come. 
So, uh, which leads me to the uh, to the concluding part, uh, which is uh, what we learned after the explosion uh, after the explosion of uh, August four, and uh, in the past year, and what uh, how should we go about uh, facing this monumental challenge? Of course, uh, immediately in the aftermath, uh, civil society was very proactive. Uh, it was on the ground uh, in terms of. Uh, uh, taking inventories, uh, establishing needs, and of course, uh, uh, helping uh, people and starting to restore damaged buildings. This is excellent, this is necessary, but it's not sufficient. Uh, we, we faced unprecedented damage, and uh, uh, not only are the buildings structurally uh, uh, fragile, but their households, their people are economically fragile. We need uh, to really uh, uh, pool all the resources we have, uh, including uh, the legal fr framework and, and financial framework of transfer of development rights. I think if it were a luxury or a possibility before the explosion, transfer of development rights to our minds at BHI is a necessary tool to finance reconstruction. This is very essential to mitigate the high cost of reconstruction and to really uh, uh, compensate the owners, not just for the real estate value of their lost development when you preserve their historic heritage building, but also to help them uh, restore the building uh, uh, in the absence of public uh, funds. Of course, Beirut Heritage Initiative was created with three horizons to do the emergency propping and covering, uh, to fund repairs which are ongoing, and of course, to establish a broad vision for the future. We don't do the work, we, we coordinate, we, we finance, we initiate, and we, we think we should be inclusive and we should pull together all uh, existing studies and uh, all uh, stakeholders and actors and agents involved be them academic, professional, civil society, or public sector. Of course, uh, thanks to the uh, efforts of uh, uh, organizations like Offre Joie, uh, we're beginning to see, in this case, Carantina, uh, uh, whole entire clusters and street blocks that are being restored. And this is not uh, traditional heritage. This is not pre-independence. This is modern heritage from the 1940s to the 60s, and they did a great job. Now, uh, really, uh, again, as I mentioned, uh, the challenge is uh, how to operate uh, with an active civic society and uh, practically failed state, who finances, who manages, who implements, and uh, uh, within what vision, this is where, uh, and why? What? Why are we doing this? Who are we doing this for? If you think of uh, different uh, objectives of protecting heritage, there are two broad categories. The more conservative and exclusive approach is to protect heritage, whether it's for tourism or real estate. And as in the case of Solidaire, it was part of the branding of the post-war downtown, Medina Arif al-Mustaqbal, the ancient city of the future. But sometimes it's, uh, po uh, politics are involved, whether locally or uh, nationally, uh, to, to, to reaffirm uh, national or local identity after a political shift, such as Berlin after unification or Barcelona after Franco. But, but the more contemporary, inclusive, and more nuanced uh, schools of thought about heritage, uh, look at things such as memory, whether it's individual or collective, and we're talking about multi-generational memory within a household, uh, you know, uh, the continuity of memory within a family in the same place. But also at the, at the social scale, um, really it's, uh, it involves socioeconomic networks, whether people live and work uh, in proximity or uh, People are used to the same uh, grocer. They've been shopping from that shop for the past 40 years, or whether uh, 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 really somebody invested a small sum of money in the area and you, you, know, you wish to kind of maintain this kind of investment. 
And, and this brings me to the notion of preserving the socioeconomic fabric. And this is very vital for Beirut because these neighborhoods are a living heritage that has evolved since the construction of the port of Beirut in the 1830s, since the widening and the internationalization of the port of Beirut in the 1830s. So uh, these areas, Jemaizi, Marum Khail, Badawi, Shaitawi, even the fringes of Sa'al Ablat, uh, Bashura, and, other, and Ilm Raisi, they all offer an alternative post war model of urban development. Rather than the development driven real estate model of demolish, invest a lot of money to build the high revenue development that will take maybe five years to complete and more years to recoup your investment. The model that has beautifully evolved in these heritage zones is a small investment kind of model whereby you get return immediately. The small entrepreneur taking a ground floor apartment to, take, to turn it into a pub or a boutique, uh, you know, and it involves very little uh, sums of money compared to uh, the high rise developments. We're talking six digits instead of seven or eight digits. And, you know, $200,000, you can fix a ground floor unit and uh, including its extension into the garden or the street. And you can have a, a very viable uh, uh, commercial or residential uh, unit. Think of all the Airbnb units that have uh, uh, matured around uh, these uh, devastated areas. So we're looking at something that is evolving, involving a whole constellation of small investments rather than a monopoly of large inv uh, investments with, with immediate returns, with vibrancy, diversity, and uh, really uh, uh, a very encouraging entrepreneurial ventures. This is the kind of urban heritage that we need to protect. This is why buildings are important to us because they are the building blocks of the city which houses people. This is a people-centered understanding of heritage. And I conclude with, uh, with this image which I took uh, at the, during uh, one of my uh, uh, daily visits to Jemaizi after the explosion. This is probably two weeks or three weeks uh, after the explosion. And really the, the sense that life needs to return and it needs to return with, the, with a certain vigor that existed before is what heritage preservation is about. And really it's what, it's really what makes the buildings important in the fabric of the city. Thank you very much. I, I think we have some time for questions and answers. Thank you, Abdel Halim. Very interesting. Um, so, uh, a first question. Uh, so, you would say that in order to preserve heritage buildings, it should be preserved as clusters. It 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 makes more sense. It it offers you more a, a larger toolbox of of things to do. And it, it, it gives you uh, uh, more results. Uh, it, it, if you, rather than protect a building, if you protect a cluster or preserve a cluster, you, 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 chances are you'll be preserving uh, public and semi-public space like alleyways, stairs, etc. It's just, it's more organically, uh, it makes more uh, sense. And, um, what, well, We've realized at the BHI that there are a lot of heritage buildings that were abandoned prior to the blast. But the, well, the heritage preservation law would include those abandoned heritage buildings. But what would be the future of those buildings if, uh, if they're abandoned? Okay, uh, two, I have two thoughts uh, on this matter here. One is why were they abandoned and two, what role can they play in the future? The first one, why were they abandoned? Probably they were abandoned for diversity of reasons, either because uh, uh, of their structure uh, level of maintenance, which is very cost. Maintaining them to, what, uh, uh, to, 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 to stay within contemporary, contemporary norms of, of living and working probably is uh, very expensive. 
and chances are uh, the owners who could uh, who are probably getting very low rents could not afford to uh, to restore them so they let them uh, they abandon them and they're left to their own devices uh, to 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 decay and eventually to collapse so this is one reason another reason is that they are deliberately abandoning them so that a developer would be interested in buying them so that would, they would make uh, this uh, uh, they would receive a substantial sum of money that would be able to compensate an increasing number of owners. Remember, these are multi-generational properties. So they may have been built by one household, but three generations later, they're owned by probably 20 or 30 people, all demanding to be, to be a part of the uh, value. So, so the only recourse for this extended uh, inheritors of this property is uh, cash to be distributed uh, according to uh, a certain uh, uh, ownership percentage. Uh, these are probably just two uh, probably prominent examples why they were abandoned. Uh, so this answers the first uh, aspect of it. Now, what role could these abandoned buildings do in the future? Uh, since we are uh, keen on revitalizing uh, the areas impact, uh, devastated by the explosion. Everything counts. While when Jemaizi, Marim Khail, Badawi, Zalablat, etc., were vibrant uh, uh, before the explosion, uh, the vibrancy and the, the, the level of economy made up for the vacant buildings. Now, every building and every street and every alleyway counts. So I think it's the importance of these abandoned buildings is that you increase the odds in revitalizing uh, and uh, create uh, adaptive reuse. I mean, these, uh, again, you want investment to come in. So one way of bringing money into the neighborhood to revitalize it and to bring money from, out, from outside the economic cycle that existed, whether it's family-based or business-based, is to bring in new investors that would uh, be, uh, be interested in turning these abandoned buildings into residential or commercial uh, 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 places. Now, of course, there is the fear of gentrification, but I think we are... Uh, I'm sorry to use the term beggars cannot be choosers here, uh, more so because gentrification is gonna happen because of the level of uh, uh, damage uh, that has done. For example, in Marum Khayil, Marum Khayil, uh, if I'm not mistaken, is the, the housing stock in Marum Khayil is almost 70% rental. So this is a very, very volatile, ratio that could go anywhere. I mean, Maram Khayil in a, in a healthy economy could gentrify in ways we cannot imagine uh, uh, in the span of three years. If the economy picks up and new uh, richer tenants are willing to rent in Maram Khayil, you're looking at a completely different neighborhood. So my sense is that the gentrification component resulting from abandoned buildings is, is insignificant compared to other no forms of gentrifications that will come from the explosion. So I'm kind of having this internal debate in my mind and I'm sharing it with you. We really have to be very vigilant about the socioeconomic profile and the scenarios we chart out for, uh, for the uh, devastated areas. But I think reviving old uh, abandoned buildings is something that would be on balance more positive. Thank you. During the presentation, you've talked about uh, heritage buildings, transition, transitional heritage, and modern heritage. Does the heritage law include the trans transitional and modern? Not yet. The current law still dates back to 1933. So it doesn't even recognize the Ottoman heritage. It only recognized pre-19th century heritage in the form of citadels, uh, most churches, etc. It doesn't look at lived-in heritage as something. So all, all of these three categories of heritage, sadly, 
are not accounted for in the existing law. In the new law, which looks at two scales of uh, heritage, one that is based on individual parcels or small clusters, and the other one being zones or neighborhoods. Yes, uh, by virtue of the fact that it looks at the urban fabric rather than uh, the architectural components of the fabric, it is inclusive of all generations. And we are increasingly uh, working with the Ministry of Culture. Of course, this precedes 2019. We were working on a way to, to include in the legal literature uh, and inventorying uh, modern heritage between 1930 and 1970. So this is work in progress. The thinking is there uh, in terms of legal text. It is there indirectly but it's yet to become part of the everyday culture of uh, the public sector, whether it's at the level of the Ministry of Culture or local authorities. Thank you, Abdel Halim. These were the questions for today. It Thank was a very you. interesting very... presentation. Thank you all for attending. Thank you, Yasmin, for organizing it. You're welcome. Thank you everyone for attending. Uh, today was the last presentation of our part one specialized presentation in heritage buildings. We will follow up uh, in a month with uh, a second layer, uh, a second cycle of specialized presentations about modern heritage. We hope to see you there. Thank you.